Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for our um, Fall Army Worm Research and Development Information Webinar with GAPS analysis to follow. So my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Janine Clark. I'm GROCOM's Manager for Biosecurity, Pest Management and Chemical Access, and I'll be facilitating um, today's session. So I'd like to start off with a welcome to country and acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and their elders past, present and emerging. And in Brisbane, where I'm located, that's the Turbal people. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to uh, welcome you all again. And um, thank you for registering today. As you did register, you probably would have seen that there was a um, opportunity to participate in a short survey to assist with identifying our audience and the needs for full army worm management with gaps in the R&D. So shortly, I'm going to introduce our speakers. But in the interim, I'm going to put the survey back up so that those who haven't already taken it can do so. Um, initially, the survey was probably more in mind for uh, growers and agronomists, but we've made a few changes to it in the Zoom participation. So if you're not a grower or an agronomist, you can still feel free to take part. Um, and of course, there's some limitations on the questions with the numbers that Zoom would give us, but that's potentially a good thing, I guess. OK, so if you'll just bear with me. Here's our poll. All right, so whilst that's up, I'll just quickly go through some housekeeping. Um, obviously, we're a large group, and uh, if you're not speaking, I would just ask that you put your microphone on mute and your camera off, just to assist with uh, managing all of that. Um, if you haven't used Zoom before, there's two icons at the bottom left of your screen that look like a microphone and a camera, pretty self-explanatory. You can click on those to mute and unmute as required. If you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to use the chat function, which is the icon that looks like a little speech bubble. And we'll have time for question and answers at the end of the presentation. So we'll be monitoring the chat throughout, that, um, uh, throughout the webinar. But if you'd like to, um, just wait till the end, we'll deal with the questions and answers then. If you'd like to view the speakers that are just the single speaker rather than the large group of participants, up on the top right, there is an icon there that uh, takes you out of gallery view and into speaker view. So you're um, obviously welcome to use that too. Okay, so moving on to some introductions. Um, we're hearing from four speakers today. And um, the first of those will be Stuart Kearns, who's our National Manager for Preparedness in RDNE for Plant Health Australia. And Stuart will address the research and development which is underway between the various research and development corporations and the newly released Fall Armyworm Continuity Plan. Then we'll have Dr. Greg, Greg Chandler, who's R&D Manager Biosecurity at Horde Innovations. So Greg will be speaking on HIA's part in the scope of R&D that's underway, including the collaborations with other RDCs. Following Greg will be Dr. Melina Miles, who's the Principal Entomologist with QDAF. And Melina will be speaking on Fulogen access. So Fulogen is the MPV from the US and also other options which she feels industry should consider pursuing in terms of research and development in partnership with agrichem companies. Uh, our final speaker will be Lisa Bird, who's a research scientist with New South Wales DPI. And Lisa's going to report on the results of resistance development findings in Fall Army Worm following the release of the report that she's been working on. So that we'll have an understanding of what chemicals are working and uh, which ones are proven not to be. Okay, so with that, I will end the polling. and um, hand over to, to Stuart to start sharing his screen. Okay. Thank you, Janine. That should be working now. Um, thanks, Janine, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Janine mentioned, what I'm going to be talking to you today is about some of the work that PHA, Plant Health Australia, has been involved in to date um, in identifying some of the existing 
uh, full armyworm R&D activities being undertaken across the country, um, as well as some of our observations. And um, um, the second part is about talking about some of the, the, the work that we've done in developing a continuity plan for the grains industry that has some, um, some, some benefits to horticulture too, in terms of um, understanding um, some of the, um, the necessary, necessary issues regarding full armyworm. Um, so first of all, I'll get straight into this. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of the response to date. So as we all can appreciate, um, full armyworm was first reported, first detected on the Australian mainland in Bamaga back in February, 2020. Um, it quickly established right across the North um, into Western Australia, WA um, and moved South in Queensland. Um, and it was quite quickly concluded that fall army worm was not technically feasible to eradicate. And this was not a decision um, that was taken lightly. Um, very soon after QDAF convened a preliminary RDNA workshop, uh, priorities workshop in March, trying to understand what are the um, what are the urgent things, the more urgent things that we needed to to stand up in terms of research and development and and even extension and communication activities that we needed to stand up, principally in Queensland, but no doubt involving others throughout the country to understand what are those important things that we needed to um, to work on. Um, so quickly moved Queensland, Northern Territory, and WA rapidly established a series of short-term activities and projects. Um, and these were principally designed to understand the likely damage from fall armyworm, you know, on which crops, what were the crops that were going to be, um, where fall armyworm were going to be found on, which could complete a life cycle, how best to prepare and manage this new pest. So it's very quickly in a, in a, a rapid response to stand up projects to um, not only um, indicate that there's there's activity happening, but to try to find some of those urgent answers to some of those urgent questions. Um, the volume of those activities increased as those sort of activities and projects worked their way through the different business and budgetary processes. You know, we moved into the, you know, the end of one financial year and into the next, so they um they sort of you know had to work their way through those sort of processes. Um, and Lastly, that now that we've had some time to reflect um, on the responses so far, there are several improvements and enhancements that are becoming more clear. And I just wanted to um, talk through um, some of those, but I'll do that in a minute after we've just gone through. Um, so we knew um, very early in the piece um, that um, after, the, after there was that initial flurry of standing up R&D activities um, across the North, um, that there was a need um, to avoid tripping over one another, um, to look at how can we coordinate things better? How can we share, um, share um, responses, share knowledge, um, share um, um, methodology uh, across the country? So it became clear that we need to identify what projects were, um, were were being stood up across the country. So first of all, there was an expert group teleconference called from um, members um, undertaking R&D right across the country. Um, that was back in the 11th of May. Um, following that, there was a JDC funded um, project looking to pull together an RDNA and a gap analysis, which was an international gap analysis with a specific emphasis on, on grains, that one. And that involved um, organisations such as CESAR, QDAF and Plant Hill Australia. And then finally, there was a, a national fall armyworm R&D forum, where once again, we brought those, um, those people involved in, in research and development on fall armyworm together to, uh, to better, uh, under, better define what it is we're actually working on. And what, are we, what were some of the new projects that started up after that end of that financial year? Um, we also know, we also very quickly understood that um, Generating a big long list of activities whilst being a good start um, was not really going to be helpful in terms of identifying where the gaps were and where opportunities for additional work might be. And so four, the four themes were established um, by the Commonwealth, so the Department of Agriculture, Water and, and Environment um, to, I suppose, map out the portfolio of fall armyworm R&D activity so we could sort of understand 
where we, where we had a lot of investment or a lot of activity and where we didn't have a lot and where some of the gaps might be within those. So those four themes were full armyworm genetic research. So that's the genetics within full armyworm. Next area about pesticide resistance, which was um, looking at um, uh, the ways in which full armyworm can develop and overcome resistance, but also how do we develop up resistance management type strategies across many different pests and across many different insecticides um, in, our, in our cropping systems. Um, a better understanding commercial and native plant hosts and you know, validating what they actually are and then understanding what that interaction um, with full armyworm is. And the last area about modeling of seasonal impacts and its, its um, impact on, um, on the population dynamics of full armyworm. So as a result of undertaking the, um, the R&D forum, um, we've identified these projects um, under the, these four headings. So um, we don't have time to go through them in detail. I'm just gonna list them all. And as you'll, you'll see that there's some areas where there's quite a lot of activity and some where there's not a lot. Um, I'd like to point out that um, each item, they're not all exactly the same with the same number of people and the same dollars and the same um, um, size and scale of activities. Um, a single activity could be very big or very small, um, very complex or very straightforward. Um, so it, it's not an indication that they're all exactly the same. But when we look at genetic research, there is work being undertaken in Northern Territory, looking at um, the diagnostics through molecular techniques um, and looking at um, genitalia examination, trying to understand the difference um, um, in terms of identification. Um, there's some characterization being work being done through ACR on fall armyworm populations, not only here across Northern Australia, but also into Southeast Asia and understanding the differences um, within those populations. Um, some insecticide response and genomic characterization work with CSIRO um, and including some part on parasitoids. Some work being done through, and again, by CSIRO on, on um, genetic characterization. So we can actually model where, not only what population or strain biotypes that we've got in Australia, but where have they come from? And what are those different sort of biotypes that are, um, um, are, that are around the world and moving around the world? Um, some work um, being um, funded through CRDC on um, uh, the bioassay and molecular studies on fall armyworm um, um, through Ag Victoria, uh, the development of a lamp assay um, for fall armyworm um, that um, it will be validated in the regions. Um, there's some more work being done in the Northern Territory looking at diagnostics um, um, and how to diagnose for lamyworm compared to others. So monitoring work in, in New South Wales, um, and I'm sure um, Lisa's gonna talk more about that. Um, some high volume, volume rapid species identification through CSIRO. So looking to um, speed up that process of how can we get a rapid species identification in the field, um, not only through LAMP, but maybe through um, other mechanisms for the future. So these aren't necessarily short-term activities. And um, a number, um, some regional sampling across our near neighbours, so New Guinea, um, Fiji, um, through the Torres Strait, that sort of thing, to understand what are the populations and stuff that we've got there. Um, uh, the next area on pesticide resistance. Um, um, so that four issues there. I'll go through these a bit quicker just to speed things up. Um, so as you can see, insecticide resistance in fall army. We're trying to understand that through New South Wales and what are they, what. Um, resistance that we that may be coming to Australia through um, that may be you know just in the population let alone developed here uh, and some efficacy work in, in Western Australia and submit the international work there's a, a lot of international work being done by FAO um, in in this particular area too. Uh, the next big area um, the commercial and native hosts um, looking at a whole range of things here, um, in, including biocontrol agents in the Northern Territory, looking at um, host preferences, um, um, host preference trials in Northern Territory, um, looking at, um, um, there's some work being done in cotton, um, not only in Queensland, but across the top end to try to understand was uh, cotton a host um, or, or would it suffer from um, an, an impact or damage from fall armyworm. Um, and yeah, moving through. So you can see a lot of this activity is being focused in the North and have been stood up by um, those three um, state departments and territory departments across the North. 
Um, and then the last area, um, modelling of seasonal impacts. So um, as you can see, similar sort of um, range of the organisations involved. Um, so Northern Territory and WA doing surveillance and mapping using pheromone traps. Um, Queensland establishing a network of pheromone traps and reporting that through its um, beach sheet program. Um, and um, trying to, um, and CESA looking at some work, do, doing a modelling of seasonal activities where we're moving from um, average climate through to more seasonal, um, within season climate activities. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of work. Um, so some of the gaps that we've identified to date um, through that process, through that full army worm um, forum um, has been um, quite extensive, I suppose you could say. Um, that we still don't, we, we need to get a better understanding of the genetic diversity we have within Australia, let alone what's coming to Australia. We know that this is not going to be the only in, um, incursion that we get from full army worm. There will be multiple incursions um, each year coming in with different, different biotypes and different alleles. Um, so we need to understand that. Um, we need better ability to be able to detect those new um, new novel species that might come in, whether they're bringing resistance or bringing other things in with them as well, new arrivals, and tracking that resistance within the population. Um, I'll skip over a few of these. Um, the development of cross industry and cross species insecticide resistance management strategy is going to be critical going forward. We don't want to put full armyworm up on the pedestal and forget about some of our other significant pests and end up developing resistance quicker than you can say resistance. Um, we need to determine, is there any varietal differences within the full army worm preference um, host, um, host plants range? Um, and then um, try to bet, get a better understanding of that relationship between trap data and full army worm management decisions, because at the moment there's absolutely no correlation. So can we use that to, um, to better influence um, some of that decision-making? Um, there's a number of other activities that are um, probably more general um, and that, that stems from um, the fact that we don't have a mechanism to support, support rapid response work that is required when exotic pests are deemed not technically feasible to eradicate. So if we get something in the future very similar to fall armyworm, um, we could run into ex the same problems and the same issues and the same communication challenges and barriers and all that sort of thing again. So we need to be, um, I suppose, a bit more strategic and think how do we how do we learn from this and how do we prepare ourselves um, into the future. Um, and and num and the second one there is really important too, fostering that support fostering and supporting a culture of collaboration across re um, between researchers across that that top end um, where those these these pathways for um, migratory type pests are going to be um, quite significant. Um, the next part, and I'll, I'll just quickly go through this. How am I going for time? I'm probably almost there. Um, there um, uh, through a project funded by GRDC, um, we've developed up a fall armyworm continuity plan. As I said, it's, this is specifically for the grains industry, but there's a, there's a, a lot of benefit there for, for other industries too. Um, it, it, it does provide a reference point and a basis for, um, for knowledge to be able to develop more, more localised knowledge and more localised plans. It's an 80-page document, so it's got a lot of meat in there, and it's including a 13-page quick guide and over 130 references, and that's available on the PHA website. Quickly going through, the, um, so the, um, the, the quick guide for the continuity plan is based on um, a, um, the, a, a fight um, strategy that we've developed. So that's, um, that's a fight stands for assess. Um, so you need to um, assess what, where you are farming, what crops you are growing, what's the risk um, to your particular business and your particular crops. Um, you need to be able to understand how to find fall armyworm um, and how to know when to start looking for fall armyworm. You then need to know about how to identify fall armyworm, and we'll get into that in later presentations, how to identify it and, and identify it correctly. Um, the thresholds approach to understand the numbers um, um, that are going to be um, approaching that economic threshold um, that are going to be causing damage before you spray, to understand those thresholds in the different crops um, and throughout the crop life cycle, um, and then enacting. So um, moving straight into um, making sure that we're applying the, the right chemical and the right strategy in the right time, um, and understanding, you know, with um, minimising spray drift and, and off-target use um, and, um, and maximising um, IPM type opportunities. 
and I will leave it there. Um, Janine, um, so um, before I won't hand back to Janine. Um, so I'll now um, hand over to Greg Chandler, who's going to talk to you about um, some of the activities that Hort Innovation are undertaking and its collaboration with, um, with the other RDCs. So I'll stop share. Over to you, Greg. Thanks, Stuart. Just gonna do the old screen. And okay. Right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Greg Chandler. I'm the R&D Manager for Biosecurity here at Hort Innovation. So I deal with all things biosecurity across the spectrum, and that includes responding to these more urgent new arrivals, such as fall armyworm and the serpentine leaf miner more recently again. So I, Stuart gave a great overview there of some of the things that have been going on in the background about looking at what we need to get into across a lot of industries. So in Hort, we look after a lot of horticultural industries, but of course this thing really affects the grains industry quite strongly possibly cotton and possibly rice as well. So we're talking about lots of different um, research and development corporations trying to, to communicate here and making sure that we're avoiding as much duplication as possible. And that's where the work by Stuart and Plant Health Australia has been uh, invaluable so far. One of the projects that we did manage to get off the ground really early on, and it was the Cotton Research and Development Corporation leading this particular initiative, but we all managed to chip in and fund a series of nine podcasts on fall armyworm. So Plant Health Australia provided great support and ongoing support for those in the background. These podcasts cover a whole range of information on this particular pest. Everything from basically what is it to some case studies in North America and South Africa a little bit of information on managing the pest and looking at your, your economic thresholds and the experience so far in Northern Australia. So we're getting a range of international experts and then coming through to our own local experts. Great series of podcasts, they're around about half an hour each. Really, really worth your time having a listen. They're available up, up on the web there at Fireside. They're also available on Spotify. So you can listen to them when you're out and about. Great initiative. We managed to get that underway really quickly and get some early information out for people to be able to use. In terms of Hort Innovation more specifically, we've got two projects. They're still going through the contracting phase at the moment, but they should be up and, up and running in uh, mid to late January, I'm hoping. Stuart mentioned one of the projects that Agriculture Victoria is running on developing a lamp assay or a rapid field-based test for fall armyworm. We propose to fund, or we will be funding, the second component of that project where they can take the test that they've developed, go out into the paddock and make sure that it works under Australian conditions with Australian species that could be confused with fall armyworm and with the different mix of contaminants that you do find out in the field. This type of test is meant to be used out in the field. You don't need a lab. You can literally park it up onto the grass if you, if you like, or you can just run it out of a local office. Nothing's toxic. It's quick, it takes 30 to 60 minutes or so to get an answer. Great way to see what you've got quickly. So the idea behind this one is to get it into the paddock, get some local biosecurity officers, extension agents and growers, bring them along to, to have a look at the test and just so, sort of having some dialogue with them. And I think a fairly important component of this project is to look at a gap analysis of what's missing in regional Australia for us to be able to roll this out nationally. The state labs can already do this for the most part, certainly in the, in the bigger state lab areas, but ideally, where do we need to have these machines in regional Australia where they're currently missing. And then we can go about trying to fill those gaps. So the idea is there's no point having a rapid test if you've got to spend a week getting a sample sent somewhere. So we're trying to get this out 
but we need to do that work first, then we can determine how we best go about rolling that out. So this project's been a little bit delayed because of COVID, because AgVic have been tasked with creating the test. Of course, the Melbourne lockdown completely locked them out of the lab other than for emergency plant biosecurity purposes. So it's, it's a natural delay. Unfortunately, we couldn't avoid it. So the, our component will begin in April or May and run towards to the end of the year, but they should have the test made by about then. So we'll be keeping a good close eye on that as we go along. The next project that we'll be funding is looking at beneficial insects and their effect on fall armyworm populations that are already here. So we have a lot of native uh, little wasps in this case. There's a lot of introduced wasps that are already here, so they're endemic. And they've already been shown to having been um, parasitizing fall armyworm in the field. And we'll hear more about that uh, a bit later. But a lot of the work to date has been done in grains areas. So this project is aiming to go into horticultural areas. Is there a different suite of beneficial insects present in horticultural areas compared to grains areas? Or are they the same? What about the weed flora that grows around or within some of the horticultural areas? Does that harbor a different suite of beneficial insects compared to what might be near grains areas? So there's certainly some important things we need to look at there. It's the aim of the project is to look across multiple regions, certainly aiming at Northern Australia, but now that the thing is at least halfway through New South Wales, if not further, at trying to target a, a more southerly region as well, if we can make, manage to make that happen. So crops, non-crop hosts, and then a bit of industry engagement in this project as well. It's only a short project, it's only around eight months. It's meant to be gathering a rapid amount of data that we can feed back to the other RDCs and then we can put that together with the other information that comes up to create future projects. But the idea is to get out some information on how do you identify these beneficial insects in the easy way. We're not talking about get out your microscope and, and, a, and a key. It's how, what's the rapid way that you can tell that you've got some beneficial insects. This will tie in with the, the state agencies uh, quite naturally in the extension space. And then looking at some management strategies. You know, how, how do we get some of these more IPM or area-wide management techniques out into the field? And what are the barriers to sort of adopting those and making those push forward? So those are the ones that we've either invested in or are about to contract. In terms of future fall armyworm investments more specifically, the RDCs have been talking to each other quite a lot to avoid that duplication. So we've all got a little bit of research going on. We do share that information. And the idea is to get back with some of this information when it's complete or halfway complete and begin to come up with some, some of the bigger, more long-term projects that go across the, agri of the plant agricultural sectors. One that the grains group are currently, um, they've submitted a grant to the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment on developing regional resistant management strategies. And we've agreed to co-fund that with some cash from, from Horde Innovation. So if that's successful, we'll be chipping into that. And that will go across at least the Northern and mid Northern Australian horticultural areas. It's definitely gonna have those all covered. and. There's obviously one there for sweet corn. We already have a resistance management strategy for that. So that would be taken and then fall armyworm would be put against that as well as other crops that might, might get affected. Importantly, you're not just managing a single pest and everyone knows that you're managing heaps. So serpentine leaf mine has just arrived. We know it's in Sydney and regional New South Wales as well as Southern Queensland it's gonna to have to be managed as well as the other pests that are already endemic. Serpentine leaf mine is another one that has significant insecticide resistance, as well as a natural resistance because of the way it, it occurs in the environment, either in the leaf or pupating in the ground. So these management plans aren't a simple, let's manage fall armyworm or let's manage serpentine leaf miner. It's how do I have to change my pest management plan 
to deal with these new problems. What is this? What are the best solutions that are going to work for me? What are the best solutions that we might try to apply across an area for successful management? So they have to be in the conjunction with current pest management strategies and plans. We're engaging through that Plant Biosecurity Research Initiative or PBRI network to develop more cross-sectoral opportunities as they arise. But we need that initial R&D work to start to settle so that we can go back to the gap analysis that Stuart put up earlier and the other research priorities and start to prioritize the funding for them and get those underway. So there's a lot of things happening at once at the moment in the background that need to happen so that we can get on with it in the foreground. And with that, I'm going to leave mine a little short so that we've got more time for questions and catch us up a little bit. And as I work out how to stop sharing, I will hand over to Melina. Okay, thank you very much. So what I've been asked to do today is to talk about Forlogen. And I guess um, whenever there's an industry consultation, Forlogen is the number one thing that people want to hear about, that they, uh, I guess, are really optimistic given the experience in Australia with Vivus Max, are very optimistic that it's going to be something that makes an enormous difference to their ability to manage um, fall armyworm. I thought while I had an opportunity, I would also broaden the conversation a little bit to some of the, some other non-chemical options, particularly biologicals, that I think it's very much worth considering if we're talking about where the R and R&D gaps are and how we might develop a, a much more sustainable fall armyworm um, management strategy into the future for not only for horticulture, but for the other industries. And perhaps it's already been mentioned an area-wide management approach. So I guess most importantly for many people, um, what is the prospect of getting foliage into Australia? I guess in, um, in the spirit of optimism, DAF and Ag Biotech uh, teamed up back in March to put a import permit request uh, to the federal government for consideration. And there was some, uh, I guess we're, we're, you know, I guess we're still in two minds about whether that uh, will be granted. And what we asked for was a, a, um, an import permit to do some experimentation with foliagen under Australian conditions. And it's really important to realise that due diligence is essential in this process and that's exactly what the department is doing. They are reviewing the safety aspects of, uh, of a novel virus for Australia that um, the Spidoptera uh, NPV is. And I guess one of the primary considerations is that we do have native, native Spidoptera species in Australia and the concern that perhaps these may be affected by uh, the Spidoptera NPV. It often gets asked whether uh, the fall armyworm may have arrived with uh, this NPV and that in time we might start to find it in the field and you know all this will be unnecessary. It seems unlikely if the immigration that we've um, we think that we've experienced has been initiated by moths. The moths don't uh, carry virus. Had the uh, outbreak or the incursion been as a result of larval infestations then and there were, were populations of larvae that had come from somewhere else then the potential that they may have had virus uh, is probably a lot higher so i think at this point where you know the general consensus is that it's unlikely that we will see um, the spidoptera frigiperda uh, virus um, that might have come with them it's also possible, we know, I guess, from, from previous work in DAF and with CSIRO and so on years ago when biologicals were much higher on the agenda during the you know, sort of insecticide resistance days of Helicoverpa, that there are lots of native viruses out there uh, and affecting the native um, Spidoptera as well. So there is some value in having a look at those. And DAF has started that process of looking at what is in our collections to see whether they have any efficacy against um, fall armyworm. So I guess you know, what I'm saying is that if this uh, permission to import foliagen as a product is not successful, then uh, it doesn't mean that we will have no access to, we, we, it doesn't mean that's the end of the road as far as it comes, as far as uh, MPVs are concerned. 
one of the things that uh, I, I wanted to be really clear about is if the permit is granted, then it will be two years at least uh, through the registration process before industries will have access to a commercial formulation in Australia. And that uh, is just the normal regu regulatory process for a new product. And I guess in addition to doing the work that is required for registration, um, in the early stages of, of doing that work, there'll also be a, a, a view to develop a management package uh, that will help growers to ensure that they can use the product um, effectively. And for those of you who are, have experience with NPV or were in the industry when NP, Helicoverpa NPV was first introduced, you'll understand that there was a, a huge learning curve around the difference between uh, applying a virus and getting it to work well and applying an insecticide and getting that to work well. And I think it will be no different with um, the Spodoptera NPV if we do manage to get a product in Australia. It's also really important to acknowledge that it's not a silver bullet. I think by Ag Biotech's own admission, this is not a product that is um, highly efficacious. I guess we're used to that with Helicoverpa NPV, that it's a, you know, it's a product that might provide you with 70, 80, 90% control, not a product that you would go out with alone under high pest pressure. And I think it's, you know, just to refresh your memory about NPVs, uh, they're ingestion active. So this product will be challenged in a, the virus will be challenged in a similar way to the insecticides in that you need to get the product to the caterpillars in order to kill them. And that, that is a challenge with fall armyworm. And MPVs are not, ex, not effective against uh, large larvae. So the strategy around deploying them needs to be very much focused on the small larvae um, and I guess that fits at this point quite well with the management practices for fall armyworm targeting those smaller larvae, those smaller larvae. But you know, there's some real upsides, and I guess that's why everyone is so enthusiastic about you know pursuing this option. And it's that MPVs are host specific and very soft on beneficial, so they're highly compatible with a, an IPM approach. Potentially, they can be applied through overhead irrigation, and that's been done very successfully with Helicoverpa MPV. And they can also persist in the environment, you know, for example, uh, providing some uh, activity through rain splash onto small plants. And they spread very rapidly when densities are high. So for, a, for and when larvae come in close contact with them. So for those of you who've had experience with fall armyworm already, you know that they're there in quite close contact with each other in the world of plants and so on. And certainly, you know, small larvae hatching are in quite close contact with them with each other for some time. So it really is, you know, it does sound on the face of it to be a product that, you know, we are needing to seriously pursue because it has some, some major benefits. But I, I would go on again to say that growers need a range of options because what we're experiencing with, with fall armyworm now is extremely high pressure, whether that's something that persists or whether this is something that we're experiencing in the early stages of the incursion, which is not unusual for a new incursion. But it's there in high densities. It's a really challenging pest to control. And for those of you who've had to deal with it, you know that it can't be effectively controlled with insecticides alone. So it's really important that we acknowledge, and it's been mentioned already today, that over-reliance on insecticides creates risks. And I think that uh, as a prelude to what Lisa has to say, you know, the development of um, Resistance in fall armyworm is a real prospect with the increased frequency of spraying. And there are other species that are there, particularly things like sweet corn, you know, other vegetables that might be affected, and even in, in uh, field corn and sorghum that have the propensity or have already developed resistance to products that are being targeted at fall armyworm. So from a, an economic and uh, productivity sustainability point of view, you know, we really are on a cliff's edge, I think, already, if we continue to focus our attentions on managing fall armyworm with insecticides alone. And it's also important to realise that, you know, focusing your attention on how you might manage this with insecticides does almost shut the door on some of the IPM practices that might have some benefit, benefit to industries, and particularly on the uh, activity of natural enemies. So, you know, some of those products are quite um, incompatible with maintaining good populations of natural enemies that can very effectively get to fall armyworm where the insecticides can't contact them. 
And in my opinion, I think that uh, population suppression will be essential to an effective fall armyworm management strategy. And it's achieved by reducing the survival somewhat at every life stage. And these, there are a number of things that we already have available to us, uh, like Magnet. Um, there are some products that we, we, I guess, are quite keen to evaluate, things for mating disruption, like pheromones, and host plant resistance, which sounds like it's a long way off. But, you know, the introduction of some host plant resistant traits may offer some considerable benefits in terms of reduced overposition and, and small larval survival, and also reduced damage just because of the physical makeup of the, the host plant resistance, things like tighter wrapper leaves on corn and so on. And then, of course, predation, parasitism and disease, uh, we're all familiar with. And I guess, you know, ensuring that those things can happen in the field um, and not precluding them through our use of uh, non-selective insecticides is, is a really important part of things. And, you know, just to give you an idea here on the, um, you know, the bottom right hand side are some eggs, uh, fall armyworm eggs that we collected in air a couple of weeks ago. In fact, over the last month or so, we've been collecting eggs that are parasitized by trichogramma. So this is not pie in the sky. These opportunities are there and we just need to make sure that we can fit them effectively into the system. And the point I guess I make here is that at the moment, when it comes to fall armyworm, few of these options are being actively um, pursued because of the uncertainty, because of the lack of experience. And, you know, the fallback is, is typically in those instances to insecticides. How might, how might we do this? This uh, pipe dream that I'm selling you. Uh, and I thought maybe the way to do it is to, to show graphically what we're dealing with. So essentially, you know, the continuum is moths, eggs, small larvae, medium to large larvae that are the most damaging, and then the pupae in the soil. And what typically we do is we focus on these uh, these stages here. And these are the ones that we target with insecticides. And that's where the effort is currently because they are dramatically impacting the plant. And these are the places that we can put these other options to increase the mortality through the life cycle of uh, fall armyworm. And I think uh, only when we can start to drop the population levels does it open up the opportunities to increasingly rely on things like natural enemies and some of these biologicals that, that just don't work as well as um, we would hope. And even insecticides, I guess, in the case of fall armyworm, don't work as well as we need them to under the extreme pressure that uh, people are starting to experience. So in order to get there, what, what are the research and development gaps? Well, this is not an exclusive list by any stretch, and there are probably a whole pile of things that I haven't uh, managed to put in there. But importantly, understanding the ecology of fall armyworm, you know, which host is it using in the landscape? How far is it coming from? If you're managing sweet corn in the Bowen area, are those moths that are laying eggs in your crops only coming from the Bowen area? Are they coming from your farm? Are they coming from the neighbours? Or are they coming from, you know, much further afield? And when we have an understanding of that, we're in a good position to make this much better decisions about what strategies are appropriate. And fundamental to making decisions about whether fall armyworm needs control or not is understanding um, when it's uh, causing yield and quality loss uh, or affecting the growth rate of the plant and all those things. So maybe not such a big issue for horticulture, but certainly a major issue for grains uh, and potentially uh, fodder production. Understanding the potential of the biologicals, not only natural enemies, but also those some of those products like nematodes and um, the baculoviruses, the MPVs, fungal pathogens and so on, and, and how they might be deployed successfully uh, in the system. And then bringing it all together, designing strategies or putting together strategy, practical strategies that work for individual farms, for their paddock or their paddocks, uh, for a district or a region. And I guess a lot of what I've sort of mentioned before up, up here really will determine what is the most appropriate scale on which we should address some of these uh, issues around better management of fall armyworm. And, Again, I'll put it up there, area-wide area approach to the management of fall armyworm populations with things like magnet um, and, uh, you know, potentially if we were to get NPV, area-wide application of, of NPV, uh, a really good application of an area-wide approach, I think, population suppression of fall armyworm. So I think that's uh, about all I wanted to say, and I just hope that it kind of gives you a sense that there's, um, you know, there's a lot that we can pursue and, 
and um, bring together to, to be able to manage fall armyworm and the associated pests in a much more sustainable way. Thank you. Okay, if we could now um, just pass to um, Lisa Bird, if you would like to share your screen, please, Lisa. Have we lost Lisa? You there, Lisa? Janine, can you hear? Yes, me? I can hear you now. Yes, you're um, muted. Are you? If I have, I, uh, can you see my screen? No, not yet. You need to press the button down, green button down the bottom. That says share screen. Oh, okay. Hang on, I seem to have lost my Zoom screen, sorry. It happens. Bear with us, folks. Technical difficulties will get there. Sorry. Oh. Well, I don't know about you folks, but I've been learning a lot of very interesting things in the last um, number of presentations and uh, looking forward to hearing a bit more from Lisa when she can get a screen operating properly, but uh, it certainly has been a, a great number of talks so far. Um, I'll let Lisa take over from here. Looks like you've got it going, Lisa, just in full screen and we're ready to go. If it won't do it from there, do it up the top on the top left. There we go, got it. Oh no, you're still in notes. Okay. There we go. Thanks, there sorry, go. sorry everyone. Um, Thanks, Janine. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yes, so today I'm just going to be talking about the results from our full army worm resistance research. And really, I guess how the learnings from that research can, um, you know, potentially better inform um, decisions in full army worm uh, management. So this research was done as part of a broader insecticide research project, which was supported by the Cotton R&D Corporation. And in the context of that project, we were really most interested in exploring whether it's actually going to be feasible to use the methods that we'd previously developed for resistance testing in Helicoverpa to be able to increase our monitoring capacity in fall armyworm. So there are, you know, some obvious advantages in doing this in terms of you know increasing efficiencies and resistance surveillance across multiple pests and I guess the key outcome of that has really been in the development of, of diagnostic tests for resistance uh, um, in, across a range of mode of action groups which are currently registered under permit for fall armyworm and it actually puts in, it puts us in a pretty good position now to be able to measure any future changes in fall armyworm resistance. So now, while we have been particularly interested in the selective mode of action groups, we also did uh, take a look at the broad spectrum groups as well, just, just to see what we were dealing with in terms of just how sensitive full army worm was going to be um, to those products. So because obviously when full army worm arrived in Australia, it was going to be carrying a legacy of, of, of years of selection with broad spectrums on a global scale. Uh, you know, which is obviously going to have potential impacts on just how useful some of those insecticides were likely to be in the Australian context. Um, but, you know, having said that, it also meant that we, we didn't have access to a susceptible reference strain of fall armyworm, which we could use as a standard comparison in, in our efficacy studies. Uh, but I guess, uh, you know, because, because the same, same range of products are registered for Helicoverpa, We've, we've actually now used our Midra as our standard for comparison to full armyworm. So, so when I go through the efficacy data in, in a minute, you'll see that we have used a laboratory strain of our Midra um, as an internal control, just because, you know, this, this is a pretty stock standard practice in terms of how we conduct these types of efficacy studies. But lab strains don't really provide a realistic baseline because, because well, they're artificially bred. They're often, you know, in, in the lab for hundreds of generations and so can, you know, suffer some pretty severe effects from, from inbreeding depression. And so that's why we've also used an unselected field strain of Armidra, just to provide us with a, a bit more of a field relevant comparison 
to fall armyworm rather than just relying on, on strains that potentially have um, already lost a lot of their hybrid vigour. But it's also quite meaningful um, from a management perspective to have that comparison with Armitra because well, we already know um, or have a pretty good sense of how Armitra responds to insecticides in the field. And so it's a, it's a bit of a yardstick in terms of relative efficacy between the two species. So I wanna talk you through the results for each insecticide group. And, and I'm gonna start with the more selective groups just because uh, I guess this has really been um, the primary focus of, of, of this particular study. So these are the um, efficacy data for emamectin benzoate. And here you'll see the dose response of our laboratory reference strain of Armidra, so the, the green line, our unselected field Armidra strain, which is the black line, and full armyworm in red. Now on the y-axis, you will be able to see a line running horizontally across the graph um, at the 50% mortality mark. And this just marks the median lethal concentration or the LC50 of the insecticide. Now the median lethal concentration of emamectin benzoate fall armyworm was about two times less sensitive than the lab strain of Armidra but it did have equivalent sensitivity compared to the field strain of Armidra. So you can see what I mean here, um, you know, in terms of the variability that you do get between lab and field strains. I guess, but most importantly, from a field perspective, that the kill at the top end of that dose range, so around the LC 99.9 mark, was similar in both species. So, so you'd expect to see a similar level of mortality in both species um, in, at the field level. So in other words, look, there's, there, there doesn't seem to be any evidence um, at this stage to suggest that full armyworm is carrying any major genes for um, resistance to emamectin benzoate. So these are the efficacy data for the group 28 insecticide chlorantronilipril. And at the median lethal concentration, full armyworm was about four times less sensitive than the lab strain of Armidra and about two times less sensitive than the field strain of Armidra, which suggests that kill might be marginal at rates below the full rate of chlorantronilaprol. But again, the rate, the rate of kill at the top end of that dose range was similar in both species. So you'd probably expect to see a similar, a similar level of mortality um, you know, at the field level. So again, it doesn't really seem to be, you know, the case that there's a significant level of, of resistance to the group 28s in fall armyworm. So this is, this is what we found with another group 28 um, product, which is cyanotronilaprol. Um, now this current isn't currently registered for fall armyworm, but it's interesting, you know, just, just, just for comparison to look at this. So we found about four times lower sensitivity in fall armyworm compared with the laboratory strain of Armidra and equal sensitivity um, in full armyworm and the field population of Armidra. Um, so, so we ended up with a similar kill at the top end of the dose range, which is pretty consistent with what we found with, um, with chlorantronilaprol. So these are the results for um, Spinosad. And again, we found no evidence for resistance in full armyworm. In fact, full armyworm was about twice as sensitive compared to Armidra, and again, similar kill at the top end of that dose range, uh, which indicates, you know, obviously a high level of sensitivity to spinosad. And these are the results for spinadaram, where we found, um, again, a similar sensitivity in full armyworm and Armidra at that lethal, um, that median lethal concentration and a similar kill um, at the top end of the dose range. Now the story with indoxicarb is a little bit different because we found that full armyworm did have a much higher level, level of insensitivity compared with the other selected groups that we looked at. It was actually on average about 20 times less sensitive than laboratory armidra and about 10 times less sensitive than field armidra. And we also found there was a significantly lower kill at the, the top end of that dose range in fall army worm. So in fact, the difference between the LC 99.9 of field armidra and fall army worm was about 50 fold. And that, that just indicates that your field rate of indoxicarb is probably not going to be high enough to be effective um, on fall army worm. But I, I guess it's unlikely that this lack of sensitivity it, is, is related to resistance because there isn't really any strong evidence to support 
the global use of indoxicarb really at a high enough level that would have resulted in any kind of significant selection pressure. So look, it's probably more likely that the reduced sensitivity re represents a, just a naturally higher tolerance to indoxicarb rather than it being because of any genetic change um, in response to selection in full armyworm. But having said that, though, it's, it's still, still nowhere near as insensitive as our um, resistant army drill strain, which, um, which you can see there, um, which is the blue line there on the right hand side of the graph. Um, that, that, that's a strain that we've selected for indoxicarb resistance in the laboratory. So resistance can, can be extreme um, under, under high, high, high selection pressure. So moving on to the broad spectrums, and I'm just going to start off with carbamates and um, methy methymyl specifically. So if Ulani worm was only about three times less sensitive than Armidra at the median lethal concentration of methymyl, but the larvae was still really hard to kill at the top end of that dose range. Um, and you can see that there um, with, with full army worm mortality, where it started to plateau at about the LC90. Um, uh, and beyond that, we really weren't able to get too much, um, too much mortality at all. And, and this is probably due to the presence of the ACE1 mutation for group one resistance. And, and this has been previously picked up by researchers from um, both CSIRO and, and, and New South Wales DPI. And I think it was found in about 50% of the population um, in samples of full army worm that came across from WA. So obviously it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty clear that carbamates are, probably won't provide much, much in the way of control at the field level, um, particularly if spray conditions are not optimal. And I guess you'll probably see the same kind of field response to methamyl in fall army worm as what you see um, with field selected armidra. And you can see that there um, in terms of the similarity of the dose response of full army worm and carbamate resistant armidra, um, which is that blue line there. Now, in terms of meth methamyl as a mixing partner for magnet, um, we're, we're really ba basing our assumptions um, on, on its effectiveness on what we know about armidra, which is that although carbamate resistance causes armidra larvae to survive, that resistance isn't actually expressed in the adult stage, and that's why magnet kills moths. But as far as we're, we're well, at least as far as I'm aware, it, it, that, that hasn't really been tested properly in full army worm yet. So I think that's something that we probably might need to take a look at um, um, shortly. And we're planning to do that actually at DPI in the next few weeks. And so these are the data for synthetic pyrethroids. And, and so, so with alpha cypermethrin, we found, um, we actually found a highly significant reduction in sensitivity. So in other words, very high levels of resistance um, to cypermethrin in full army worm. So, so the me at the medium lethal, lethal concentration of cypermethrin, um, we saw between 40 and 60 times um, lower sensitivity than the susceptible army strain. And I guess the most telling thing here is that it's very, very hard to kill full army worm at the top end of that dose range, which just indicates you know, that, that the fill rate of cypermethrin is, is probably not going to do much in, um, in, in terms of effective, um, giving effective control. And, and in fact, full army worm is even harder to kill than SP resistant um, at the at the high end of that dose range. And the result for gamma cyhalothrin um, so shows pretty much a similar thing with full army worm being about 50 times less sensitive than susceptible armidra. And it's even less sensitive to cyhalothrin than resistant armidra. And again, just really, really hard to kill at the top end of that dose range. And so, you know, just again, sort of supports that, that, the, that the evidence that, you know, it's really highly unlikely that SPs are gonna control full army worm, even, even under the most ideal of field conditions. So I suppose one of the questions is, well, why is full army worm so resistant to SPs? Well, of course, as, as we've said, you know, global selection pressure is the thing that's that's driven resistance levels to such a point that you know cells to make SPs pretty much ineffective in full army worm. And there's also some pretty compelling evidence to suggest that the reason for this is because of metabolic detoxification in full army worm. And this evidence has come from our inhibition studies where we've used the Synergist uh, PBO or, um, well, P P 
piperonal butoxide. Um, and you can see the effect of PBO um, in this graph here. So the solid red triangle shows the dose response for cypermethrin um, in full army worm that I, I, I showed you before. And the open triangles is what happens when you add PBO to the cypermethrin. And what you see is that resistance is suppressed by about 35 fold. And so it pushes that whole dose response right back down towards um, the susceptible baseline. And you also end up with a, with a similar kill to what you see in susceptible amidra, um, even at the high end of that dose range. So a similar thing with cyhalothrin, where PBO suppresses resistance by about 63-fold. But synergism didn't actually seem to be quite as strong with cyhalothrin compared to cypermethrin, um, particularly at the high end of that dose range there. So this is just to summarise the, the findings from the um, resistance study that we've done. So we found no, no resistance to emamectin benzoate group 28 sulspinosins. There was lower activity of indoxicarb in full armyworm, uh, most likely due to just to, due to natural, naturally, um, na naturally higher tolerance levels. Uh, there was a moderate resistance to carbamate, uh, which is likely due to a target mechanism, um, target site mechanism, mechanism previously identified as the ACE1 mutation. And there's very high resistance to synthetic pyrethroids um, with very strong evidence that that's due to um, um, a metabolic resistance mechanism. But you know, as, as, as we've already said, you know, with, as with, and with, with any pest, there's, there's always going to be considerable potential for selection of resistance in fall armyworm to those, to those selective insecticides, even though we currently do have very low resistance um, to those. And that, because that could easily change um, if, if insecticide use increases. And also, as we've already said, you know, resistance management is going to be so particularly important because of the overuse of in in insecticides could also threaten efficacy of those products in Helicoverpa if spraying occurs in crops where those two species occur together. So, yeah, uh, uh, and all, that currently there is no, I guess, no sort of formal resistance management um, strategy in place before alarm you obviously, you know, that's going to change over time. But in the meantime, I think, you know, that the key principles of resistance management and IPM, you know, that they really should, should be applied, um, you know, when, when making spray decisions. So obviously things like regular monitoring, um, timing of applications um, of, those, of those selective products on above threshold populations. And I guess most important of all, rotating those insecticides with different modes of actions, that's going to be critical in terms of minimising resistance risk in both full armyworm. Um, and in Armidra. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lisa. Appreciate that. That was really interesting. Okay. Um, just bear with me. So yeah, I'd really like to thank all of our speakers today, Stuart, Greg, Melina, and Lisa. Um, that was really informative. I got a lot of out of it. I'm sitting here very, taking notes furiously, even though I know that the uh, slides will be provided um, afterwards. But um, yeah, there's lots there that uh, I wasn't aware of. So it was really helpful. Um, so thank you very much for that. We're gonna move on to our question and answer session yet. I see that the chat forum has been stony silent. This is your opportunity to ask some questions. Please don't be shy. Um, if you would like to, you can um, you know, put your hand up and, and we can flip to you uh, uh, visually or audioly if you like, or you can put them in the chat if you believe you'd like to do that. Um, but Lisa has to go on to another engagement from here shortly. Uh, the other presenters will be around for a while. Um, but I just ask that if anybody has any particular questions for Lisa about resistance development findings, if they could pose those first so that um, then Lisa can uh, go on and we'll move on to any other questions in whatever order anybody would like to um, address them. So are there any questions that anybody would like to ask Lisa at this time? Stony silence. Well, I have a question anyway. Um, Lisa, I've heard you talking about metabolic detox in fall armyworm. Now that's um, a term that I'm not quite familiar with. 
And I was hoping maybe you could explain that a bit better. Uh, and also I hear there's types of resistance, there's metabolic resistance and perhaps something else as well. Um, are you able to just expand on that a little bit for me? Absolutely. Um, thanks, Janine. Yep, so, so um, the metabolic resistance that we've found in fall armyworm to SPs, that the basis of that is, is um, uh, high levels of enzymes. So the, the, the insects have been, have evolved to overcome the toxicity of so, um, synthetic pyrethroids by increasing the concentration of enzymes that can actually detoxify the, 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 the chemical. So that, that's the nature of metabolic resistance. That's quite different to target site resistance, which is what we see um, as the likely cause of carbamate resistance in fall armyworm. So that's, be, that, that's actually due to a single point mutation in the genome, which, um, which then allows the insect to overcome the toxic effects of, um, of things like methamyl. Okay, well, look, thanks for that. Um, I know you've obviously done a lot of research into the different um, uh, groups of chemistry and uh, that's available. I'm just wondering if any of the agronomists who are present today have um, had any differing experiences with their um, applications in the field. If anyone's brave enough to put their hand up or to um, comment on that. I'm gonna dob Andrew Sippel in, I believe he's here. Still there, Andrew? Yep, still here. You know, I agree with the um, in doxicarb uh, applications. It yeah it seems to work or not work. It's very hit and miss how it works. Um, and yeah, you don't get a very good kill with it. Um, okay, thanks for that. Appreciate that, Andrew. Um, are there any other questions for Lisa while she's still with us? Take silence as a no. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, for your time. I appreciate that. And uh, if you have to, to leave, you're welcome to do so. And uh, our grateful thanks for, for being here today. Thank you, Janine. Okay. All right, well, look, we've got plenty of time uh, in our schedule. We've got about 15 minutes left to have some questions. Um, I'd really like to see some asked. I know that there's a, a lot there and um, I'm sure that there are uh, thoughts in your head that are going around. So open it up if anybody's got something that they would like to ask. All right, there's a couple in the chat there. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. Um, I see that Ian has asked about OPs. It might be a bit late if Lisa's already left. Pardon me, sorry for that. Um, and how would chemigation work with 28, group 28s and emomectin in relation to resistance management? Okay, we might have to take those questions on notice. Apologies, I didn't see them coming through. Um, is there anybody else that has any other questions for our other speakers? Um, I know that there was quite a lot of um, interest in Magnet leading up to this, uh, and Melina has given us a, a lot of different information there. Um, it was very interesting to note that um, the methamol, the, the um, resistance in that is um, not effective, not a problem so far with moths. Okay, I've got a question here. Any previous experience to indicate how long the PBO synergist may help to manage fall armyworm specific resistance, or SP resistance, sorry. With longer term use, this became ineffective for imidra in cotton prior to BT cotton. So more of a comment there.
All right, so we're a shy bunch today. That's interesting. Um, uh, it's really good to see that the um, uh, the two people that we've had speaking from Plant Health Australia and, sorry, um, PHA and um, HIA have been talking quite a bit about our um, engagement with um, extension opportunities there and that that is going forward and we look forward to seeing some of that happening uh, when the projects are, have come through. So um, has anybody got any questions for, for Greg and Stuart on those line along those lines? Yes, Andrew, you'd like to say? No? Okay. All right, well, look, um, we've got to the point where we've got um, about 15 minutes up our sleeve. What we might do is, um, if there's no further questions at this time, uh, just take a break for a comfort stop and um, ask everybody to stay online uh, because we have a, a needs analysis session that's coming up after this. Um, I hope that everybody has uh, given some thought to what the gaps are after this that they'd like to um, talk about and how we can feed them through in our information back to the um, representatives that we have from um, HIA particularly today through, through Greg and also through Stuart through PHA. Um, so what we might do now is just go for a quick break. So I'll give everybody um, 10 minutes and uh, if you would just leave your computers on and then come back at five to three at the latest. So um, with that, we'll just take a quick break and uh, come. Um, they're actually undertaking it um, in some of those um, um, some of those more tropical pastures up there because of the the, the cattle um, um, the beef cattle industry up there that and it's not grain or not not vegetable so it's sort of west of Kananara um, but looking at you know how they can preserve some of their um, their fodder um, and preserve some of their their hay crops where they are growing hay um, but they are looking at it in that that's where I know where it's, it's happening. Um, but yeah, it needs to be, needs to be more, uh, a more formal trial to, to understand, um, yeah, what impact it is having and what it's favoring and how it's behaving across the landscape. Um, we've heard from, um, th there is two schools of thinking, but, but I think we're hearing loud and clear that it should be, um, a landscape based approach rather than, pick a plant and go looking for fall armyworm in that particular crop or in that particular weed species, look at it across the landscape because it is going to be using refuge crops, if you like, or it is going to be using weeds. It's going to be using other plants in the environment on either on farm or within the area or the region um, to build up on. And we need to be aware of that. Um, so it is very much about, um, yeah, understanding it in the landscape rather than, in the particular weed species. Yeah, so mm -hmm. um, there's, there's probably not broad um, broad work. Melina might be more familiar with some of the work in Southern Queensland, I'm not sure, but um, there, um, yeah, there needs to be more work done in that um, understanding the impact on other pants. Melina, did you want to comment? Yeah, so I guess my comment was that I'm not aware that there's any formal investment in work in that area. There may be some uh, minor work going on sort of, um, 
out, out of the state departments, but there's nothing nothing formal and certainly nothing that would nothing in place that would enable anybody to do that work in the rigorous way that it uh, it needs to be done. That DAF has made an investment in a fall army worm in, uh, response and. We have started that work. So Richard Sequira has a, a network of traps from the grazing lands, uh, sort of from Julia Creek through to the Burdekin. And uh, the theory that they're working on is that um, when activity is detected, they will go to those sources and look to see what the potential hosts are locally or whether those are migratory populations. And that will be inclusive of uh, pastures as well as um, as they get into the, the agricultural areas, I guess, both crops and non-crop hosts. One of the things that I, I did want to mention is that, you know, um, the presence of fall armyworm in things like pasture and weeds and so on around agricultural areas may not necessarily be a threat. You know, the, if there is, if those areas are undisturbed and there's good natural enemy activity, they can actually be of benefit in terms of forming a reservoir for natural enemies that can then move into crops, which is, you know, typically a much more disturbed system through the use of insecticides. So things like trichogramma egg parasitoids, for example, they can survive pretty well, despite some of the, you know, sort of stories in a, in a quite heavily sprayed environment if they have a refuge and then they make forays out into crops where they um, parasitize eggs. And for some period, those eggs are protected from insecticide impact or those wasps are protected from insecticide impact while they're developing in the egg. So I think that it's, um, you know, there's more to it than just sort of totting up where you find fall armyworm uh, in which hosts and assuming that that's always a negative for agricultural production and fall armyworm management. That's interesting because, um, you know, like where I was concerned personally about the thought of, um, you know, these different crops having fall armyworm in them, and if not everybody was treating them, they might be building up reservoirs. And of course, um, having a natural reservoir, uh, as you say, could then give an opportunity for our, our natural predators and, and uh, parasitoids to, to develop along with them. So um, it's very interesting to have that thought pattern behind, um, you know, what's going on here. Um, has that factored in with what, um, Stuart, with what is currently being looked at or I mean, Melina said she's not aware of, of the um, yeah. you know, formal investment in that area, but. Um, no, it, it's, it'd be too early to say, Janine, okay. too early to say that. No, I, I'd, I'd say, I'd be leaning towards saying no, um, but it needs to, definitely. Yeah. And, then, and then it's just a matter of then trying to cut the cloth to suit. Um, you know, um, there's lots of things that are going to be a priority, but um, what, what project work actually gets done is, it, is another thing. But it's um it, it's good to note that it is important. Sure. Okay, are there any other comments there that people would like to make about uh, host crops and green bridge? Um, Janine, with the coarse crop and the cover crop is a bit of a, um, bit of concern for some of the horticulture crop. Uh, they're using sorghum as a summer crop during the off season. So there's a bit of question nowadays is the sorghum, how much is going to cost the fall army worm and when the new crop planted that, you know, then they can move into the crop. So that's a bit of thing to look into that. Uh, uh, into sorghum or maybe any other grass crop put as a cover crop or soil erosion crops. Okay. So the mostly yeah. the sorghum is a commonly used, uh, photo sorghum is commonly used around here for the summer, uh, summer crop. Thanks, so much. Yeah, spoilers for soil conservation and soil erosion type thing by a cover crop. Yeah, okay. Any other comments there? All right, so we've already sort of touched on seed treatment options that there are some investigations going on there with um, both hort and with grains in different areas. They're not at liberty to say what particular chemicals as yet, but they were, I think, uh, group 28s that they were looking at and the other issues that we had around that. So I think perhaps we've already covered that one sufficiently. Does anyone have any other things that they'd like to add there at this point? There's also to mention that um, some chemical companies also working on some seed treatment option. They're doing some private um, trials um, to see 
the rates, um, what rate is working and how long is working, that type of work. Yes, some work has been initiated on with some seed companies also. Sorry, some chemical companies. Okay, good to know. Excellent. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. So area-wide management. Can I just ask strategy. one question first, please? Yes, certainly, Pat. With the um, Group 28 chemicals that they're looking at investigating and looking um, researching into, are the researchers also identifying areas that have uh, management plans in place regarding resistance, already resistance to Group 28, i.e. the Lockyer Valley? Well, Lisa's not here to field a comment on resistance. Melina, do you have anything you could add to that? Uh, I think probably John Duff's on the line, I John, see. Yes, He's probably John's closest here. to the Lockyer Valley uh, resistance management and how, you know, say Group 28 C treatment, for example, might play into that. I haven't um, actually sent any larvae or pipi off to Lisa as yet. Um, I'm still having issues with my colony. Um, so, yeah, I just don't know what level of resistance we've actually got here yet. So but once I get enough, and I do, I, I do want to send um, samples off to Lisa to get tested to just, just to see what level of resistance we do have here. I think, John, the question was, was a bit more about, you know, the, the resistance management strategies that you have in place already in the Lockyer Valley and whether the introduction of a group 28C treatment would be problematic. That's correct. Uh, okay. Um, hang on. Um, well, there isn't a resistance management strategy for sweet corn. There's only one for um, brassicas. Yeah. Um, and that's for diamondback moth. So diamondback moth don't get into sweet corn. So I can't see there being an issue in that respect if you're using a group 28 as a seed treatment, um, unless, you're, unless you are worried about the heliotha side of things. And, and I don't know what, whether they've done any testing down here against um, group 28s for heliothas, not as far as I'm aware. So I really can't see that being an issue at the moment. It may be down the track. It was just more to protect the group 28, John, is where my head was thinking. Yeah, um, uh, I think, I guess, it does depend what you want to, what you're actually targeting with that group 28. Yeah. So, and like I said, we, you, the only resistance management strategy we have here is against... Apparently it's Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, at the moment, yeah, I can't see it an issue. Um but yeah, it may be down the track. Okay, hopefully it's not a track we want to go down though. Yeah, let's hope. Correct. I find it interesting because Lisa's presentation seemed to uh, indicate that in you know, her lab trials that there was uh, no resistance for 28s. So are we finding that there are pockets where perhaps they're not working as well, such as the Lockyer Valley? Has that been your um, experience? Uh, or have I got that wrong, Melina? I see you've got your, ca your camera on. No, my understanding is that there's been no detectable shift in susceptibility or no significant shift in susceptibility in Helicoverpa, and that would probably be, you know, has been targeted for a long time or incidentally targeted in other crops where group 28s are used for other pest species. So uh, that that's, I guess, what uh, Lisa's um, resistance monitoring program has shown for a number of years but I think that the concern about group 28s is just that there's a much uh, bigger potential for the number of applications um, with the introduction of fall armyware. And we need to be mindful of that when we're putting together resistance management strategies. Thank you. Um, any further comments on, on that? Or would you, um, is there anyone who'd like to comment on the area-wide management strategy? Now, I, I realise that there are um, plans of fortune. I think, Stuart, you had mentioned that there's certainly some um, projects going on for area-wide management uh, in the north and um, into the central parts of Australia. Is that right? Um, Probably not area-wide management it's as such, but that's definitely um, an identified gap, an opportunity for the, the future, Janine, definitely. 
Because yep. one of the things we noted is, that, you know, it would be great to, um, like the area like the Burdekin, which is a bit of a melting pot of different uh, commodities being grown, where you've got, you know, horticulture and you've also got grains and you've got cotton and, and cane as well. Um, and it's been interesting to note that in the past, cane particularly has, has looked at armyworms, not necessarily fall armyworm, but armyworms as a, a, a tolerable nuisance because they, they just eat the leaves and they're cyclic in their nature and they pass through. And, and so their mm. response has been to keep a watching brief. Um, but, you know, as we've mentioned before, harbouring in other crops could also be a problem. So um, looking to see what we can get in the way of uh, future development and bringing everyone into the, the one um under the one umbrella to, to talk area-wide management if we can convene that. And I believe that that's sort of going ahead in the future anyway. I think there were some plans there. Is that right, Stuart? Um, it's been identified as a gap, yes. A gap, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's nothing so there's, um, to, to, No. Um, you know, there's, there's one part. I mean, to do area-wide management successfully around the country, um, you know, there's a hell of a lot of areas where we've got a whole range of different crops going. Um, um, so very much, that's that's the approach we need to go. That's probably more in, into the, the delivery, understanding existing area-wide management approaches um, and, you know, using those networks that are already established between growers and, and, and advisors, no matter what they're growing, uh, around the country and how we can feed information into them looking at insecticide resistance strategies more generally across the whole range of pests and the crops that they grow rather than looking for a standalone fall armyworm and force it down people's throats I think that, that that's the, the the more medium term approach that we need to be able to um, look to how we deliver and how we deliver this message and deliver the tools it's um, certainly a very complex issue yeah and uh, not yeah. without its um complexities in, in getting all the hurting all the cats together to <laughs> to get it sorted in some way shape or form but um, appreciate all of that yeah okay. I, I wonder sometimes what people mean when they say area-wide management Janine yeah. you know it's a, it's a bit like saying IPM you know you know it yes. means different things to different people and I um you know we have some experience with area-wide management we did a, a you know, a project that ran for nearly 10 years, bringing cotton and grain together around the Hilly Caverpa uh, management. Um, and that, you know, it was really multifaceted, but the most important part of that was really, you know, for, some, for growers and their agronomists attempting to do something new, uh, the probably the most valuable part of that was the opportunities for the growers and the agronomists to get together uh, with technical specialists and talk about what they were doing, what was working, what wasn't. And for the technical specialists, to provide that sort of short-term support for the questions that they were asking. For example, you know, in, in um, grains, when we started that area-wide management uh, project, one of the things that they, the growers used to say is that we don't have parasitoids because we use synthetic pyrethroids. And so we undertook a project where we monitored a number of fields for uh, egg parasitism and larval parasitism. And we were able to show them that, in fact, you know, there was a reason for them to pull up on you know, the use of synthetic pyrethroids and other broad spectrums if they had options because there were natural enemies there that were worth protecting. So, you know, that that I think, in, and, and the peer pressure aspect was really important too. You know, if you're looking at a resistance management strategy that's implemented across the district or you're looking at reducing the broad spectrum used to encourage natural enemies and support releases and things like that, um, the peer pressure was incredibly important in terms of how people made their decisions. So, I think that, um, you know, if there are already groups operating, uh, local groups, you know, be agronomy groups or whatever it might be, you know, they, they are excellent, as Stuart said, excellent starting points for bringing people together. And you can call it whatever you like um, and probably more appropriate area-wide man management strategy if you're doing something like applying magnet or making insect, you know, insect releases to, suppress, you know, attack the population on a population level. So um, I don't think it's such a big thing that you need to shy away from it because you can start really small with specific goals and then build onto it as, you know, the experience and the need grows. All right, well, those are very wise words. Thank you, Melina. Obviously your experience there is um, uh, really good. So um, I see that uh, Tua has a, sorry, Tua, I don't know how to pronounce your first name, but there's a question about the seed treatment 
that you'd like to ask? For some reason, I can't see the chat. Are you able to vocalise that one, Scott? Oh, uh, yep. So Tao is Tao, in, sorry. He's in Home Hill. And so he's got a question about, are there any other chemical groups registered or will be registered for seed treatment on full armyworm? Is there any of our speakers who want to address that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't have that information in front of me. It should be. Um, All right, so we might have to take that, that question on uh, notice and uh, park that for the time being, Tao. Um, apologies for that, but... Um, okay, so the next opportunity that we had to discuss here was um, training in beneficials, IPM, spray application and use of magnet. I kind of combined all of those because they seemed of a, of a similar nature uh, and uh, also trying to just limit the number of dot points there. Um, We've got obviously the HIA project, which we've um, heard Greg talk about and the beneficials there. We've had some specific uh, questions or feed into that that's worth looking at with our Southern um, beneficials and predators versus the Northern ones and whether the ones that are in the South could also work in the North and if they're better in some way. Are there other um, comments or queries that people have along those lines, ways in which we could add to the research that's happening. So you said there was a IPM program or a resistance measurement program for the Diamondback Moth in Group 28. So have we done anything like that in Sweetcorn? Seeing as the full, you know, um, full armyworm attacked Sweetcorn pretty severely. So I think there is, um, an IPM strategy for sweet corn, but I think it's for Heliothus, if I'm not mistaken. Was that does that ring bells with anybody? Yeah, it was Janine. Um, <clears throat> it was developed a number of years ago as part of a couple of large um, sweet corn projects that we ran through the department here, um, and it was primarily for Heliothus, um, but with full armyworm. Uh, it's going to make that very difficult now to keep that going because of the use of um, a whole range of insect <clears throat> insecticides. Because at the time, trichogramma was very effective against heliath, especially later in the season, and growers really didn't need to spray for heliothus at all. Um, but now with full armyworm, it's going to make that really difficult. Um, and I guess... The, one of the things that would be nice to look at is what effect a lot of these chemicals are going to have on the beneficial populations now, um, especially the trichogramma. Um, and also there is another egg parasitoid which is supposed to be as good, if not better, and that's the telonomus. Um, it's a little bit larger than trichogramma and whether it is better because it can actually get into the egg mass and lay more eggs. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it would be nice to see how these products are going to actually affect the beneficial population in general. I know there's a lot of work being done on a lot of these beneficials, but um, it hasn't been done in sweet corn. So yeah, with, yeah, with full IBM, I think IPM is going to be very difficult. Not impossible, but yeah, it's a bit more of a challenge of growers. Is there um, any way I, to get a project up and running for that? Or? That would be good. Um, and we could certainly involve a lot of um, participants in that. We'd have to involve a lot of participants. Uh, the ones when we had it here, we had a, quite a few researchers working on it at once. They've all either retired or moved on to other other roles. And so 
yeah, certainly would need to involve a lot more um, stakeholders from around the uh, around the country looking at that sort of thing. Well, just a comment, um, Jenny, in with this training mm -hmm. beneficial. We need, first we should know <laughs> which beneficial is working better on polar mealworm. So a lot of beneficials are sometimes we generally say is uh, working on, but no, there's been, there's no hard data or anything on which beneficial is working or which beneficial not working. So there are, you know, predators and parasitoids are there, but there are some we need to identify what is the potential benefit beneficial for mass releasing or inundative releases to make it to work. Um, so at the moment we are doing some small survey around here. We're finding some larval parasitoid on uh, polar mealworm. So that still is a bit of early stage to comment how, how potential that one. But um, egg parasitoid is a bit of still a bit of question. We're not finding any good egg parasitoid here yet. Um, yeah, it says definitely the IPM is a good approach for sweet corn mainly because um, without IPM program is really hard for otherwise the insecticide usage is going to be very very high. So. Um, so super, I noticed in one of the uh, other um, webinars that um, we had recently about uh, plant pests that we really don't want that we were involved in together. Um, you mentioned that there were like assassin bugs and other things that were um, yep. being trialled or had some good results with. So I don't know whether you want to discuss that a little bit just to give the guys on board. Here. Yeah, we're finding a um, couple of predators um, endemic to endemic and they found in the sweet corn area with the high polar mealworm populations. Um, say some, um, um, yeah, um, yeah, assassin buck and also there's a good um, um, shield buck, uh, shield buck, uh, corn shield buck and the numbers are a bit small, but they can eat, can build up um, eventually. Um, so that's a area more we need to be focused on that. Um, Actually, in parasitoid is one part, but still predators are doing reasonably potential job on that uh, one. So this be um, yeah, but um, I think yeah, we need to do more work on that. But um, we just started establishing small colonies to do some studies how it's working. Um, so um, yeah, um, uh, what's other um, even some general predators like. Um, Ear weeks and thing also started feeding on uh, uh, full army worm larvae. We noticed uh, there's a bit of things uh, you know, happening now, so maybe a bit expanding early next year on this. Mm -hmm. And now we've got Magnet down there. We've sort of mentioned that a little bit today, but I'm going to throw Melissa from BASF under the bus a little bit here. I don't know whether, yeah. Melissa, if you'd like to comment at all about Velifer and um, anything there that might be helpful because people have expressed an interest in that too. Uh, yeah, we're still following up, Janine, as far as understanding whether or not there's any efficacy there. So I'm sorry, I don't have anything re to report on today, but um, we will be getting back to you on that one as soon as we can. So the... Um, there's been a lot of work that's come from um, overseas for that particular um, product. And so we need to communicate with there and have, get a better understanding of whether or not this is going to provide a solution. Okay, thank you very much for, for just at least commenting on that. And um, uh, we'll look to that down the track, I suppose, as another potential option if uh, the efficacy is proven to be um, uh, useful there, so appreciate that. No problem. Um, is there anything more that people would like to to talk about with? Oh, this is why I can't see chat because participants is hiding it. That's good. Um, is there anything more that people would like to uh, ask about or have discussed further in regards to the use of magnet? Um, we've touched on that a bit today, and, and um, Melina obviously mentioned it in her presentation about uh, good options to, to use in an IPM strategy. Um, are there any further comments or questions there? Um, just a quick comment, um, Jenny. In, um, not only Magnet, there are some, some other semiochemical product also started coming in the, on a trial basis or in the market now. 
-hmm. so there are um, so some organic toy product and um, and also some similar to magnet you know there's another some new chemical product also the one this probably i can't i don't know how which one is better than others or which work in a different environment is i think there's a lot more work to do on that even the toxic and we are adding into the magnet we don't know how quickly is killing the polar mever more so that's need to be also need to be looked into that ian you've got your camera on yeah yeah melina is prodding me um i, I did <laughs> i did a little bit of work on the um, developer because uh, i am looking at a number of uh, the various asiana isolates um and um yeah, they're not, well, nothing I've tried is particularly good on, on full army room as far as the very Bassiani goes. And the Veloper certainly, um, yeah, was, wasn't effective at all uh, on the initial sort of bioassays I had. So yeah, I'm not, not holding a lot of um, hopes for the use of Veloper and full army room. Okay. Um, yeah, my note to. Yeah. Oh, very much for that feedback. I'll be able to provide um, a more um, solid answer on that when I receive uh, feedback from our experts overseas who have years of experience with this particular product. But thanks again for your feedback. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Ian. I'm going to throw somebody else under the bus that I know here. Um, Shane Stefan from Novum Life Sciences. Life Sciences. I, you guys have got a number of different semi-chemical products that are being um, looked at, I suppose. I don't know whether um, you'd like to comment at all there. Well, we've got a micro lab and we have a number of different strains that we've got here that we are doing internal research on. So I can't really comment much more on it with confidentiality, but there are stuff that we're looking at for full army worm and other grubs and other pest management resistance um, for use in IPM programs. I guess it's just um, encouraging for those that are here to know that there is the other options that are being considered and looked at. Yeah, and yeah. to have a little bit of hope for the future that there are other avenues that could, you know, offer some some help there. Yes. Yeah. There's like I said, there's there's so many different microbiological strains out there that we, you know, that they say we know more about um, the dirt on other planets than the dirt on our own. So. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but we are okay. looking into stuff internally in research to find the best solution. Great. Thank you for that. I appreciate you making some comments there. Um, are there any other comments or questions that people would like to, to ask? Um, another topic that I had here was access to emergency use permits and, and registrations. Um, and we know that HIA were very uh, forward in getting onto the front foot with um, applications for permits and having them ready. Jody Pedrana did an amazing amount of work in scoping out um, things with resistance and so forth uh, in other countries and what we have available now for, for, for army worms in general and what also works on Helicoverpa that might work on that. And so she has worked tirelessly to put through a whole heap of um, different permits with, to give uh, horticultural crops and a range of um, actives and mode of, modes of action so to help with resistance management as much, much as possible. Um, I guess what the main challenge will be going forward is getting those uh, permits converted into registrations. Um, we know that that can take some time and obviously the emergency use permits that I've been seeing coming through have been there for, um, given for granted for three years or thereabouts. Um, are there any comments or, or queries that anybody would like to raise along those lines? Take silence as, as a no. Okay, so um, this, the, I think this might be the last one in this uh, set of topics that I had here. We can always throw it open to others if there are more than what has been um, put on this uh, slide here, but uh, the economic and agronomic thresholds. Now, that uh, the thresholds topic has been thrown about quite a bit. And um, I think, uh, Stuart, that was part of your AFAST uh, treatment in the full army worm contingency plan, if my memory serves me. 
Um, and most of the thresholds that we're working on at the moment, I think, are based on international knowledge. And we're still trying to work out what is applicable in Australian circumstances, if I'm not mistaken. Does um, anybody want to comment or ask questions or add to um, the topic of thresholds? I guess I'll, I've got a I've got a question for um, maybe Andrew, for example, or anyone else who's managing sweet corn. Whether thresholds really have a role, um, and you know how how you would go yeah, about it was, that. It. I was going to say, like, um, you're trying to grow a crop with zero damage, basically. So you got to have a, it's it's all, almost a zero um, uh, policy on them, especially once you get fruit. Um, or you hit the, the fruiting stage of, of the life cycle, but it's more how much can we actually sustain, how much damage can we sustain in the vegetative stages and still um, produce a viable cob um, that's, you know, from there. Yeah, so, um, so I, I'll admit I don't know very much about sweet corn growing, but I, I, you know, I know a little bit about thresholds, and I guess I suspect that there are two components for sweet corn. One is... Um, the rate of growth and the impact on that from defoliation in the vegetative stage, which might not impact on yield necessarily, but at some point will if you get enough defoliation. I, I wonder, you know, when I think about sweet corn as opposed to field corn, I wonder, you know, and thinking about, you know, from DAF's point of view, where we might put our, our effort, for example, um, whether there is any value in looking at the impact of fall armyworm at different rates of defoliation at different stages of the vegetative crop um, in terms of your well, ability think, to forecast your your rate of growth and time to harvest? Well, I think it's, I think what we did see a little bit of is the, there's a lot of fall armyworm damage in the vegetative stage. It actually sets the plant back, so it makes your crop uneven. Um, mm. So they come harvest time, you got yeah, immature versus overmature cobs. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay. So there, there is something around that that might be of value. Yeah. Yeah. Shani here. I just wanted to say too that the threshold, economic thresholds, and agronomic thresholds are very important to consider too when you're creating IPM programs. So you need to know when is it too much, and you need to change your strategy. So knowing when the damage is going to cause an um, economic impact is very important for growers. So they know whether they need to change the products that they're using, are pests not, are their predators or beneficials not working and how to manage and monitor that in their programs. Yeah, yeah that's right. So like when you've got um, low numbers, you might get away with a BT spray, but if you've got high numbers, BT is just not gonna do anything for you. Well, um, well exactly. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that, isn't it, Andrew? Because, you know, the theory behind an economic threshold is you make an assessment of whether the pest is likely to cause you some economic loss. Is it above or below that level? And then if it is, you implement some control that causes that damage accumulation to cease. With fall armyworm, you can't reliably cause that damage to cease no matter how hard you try. So I think... You know, the reality of the situation is that for sweet corn, probably what you're doing is more accurately described as population management rather than anything like an economic threshold approach. And in, and in field corn, when I think about field corn, I just sort of think, are we really do it, going to effectively get an economic threshold? Because if we can't control them, um, an economic threshold isn't really very worth very much other than it tells you you're going to lose something that you can't stop. So what's the take home from that? Is there the things that we should be looking at differently? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's it needs to be a little we bit more up. thoughtful. Go, Andrew. The field corn we were looking, or the maize corn we were looking at up in the burdock and the high numbers of full army worm didn't really seem to cause that much of an economic loss. Um, caused, I think, more of a, quality issue rather than a, a yield issue. Yes, all the far pull army worm I've seen has been yield quality issues is the biggest problem. 
you know, having to change your product from a, a fresh cob to a cut cob twin pack, for example. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, Stuart, you've got your mic and thing on. You have a comment? No? I don't. Okay. No. Yep. I, th I think um, the one the one thing that came clear to us um, on thresholds is um, the fact that we may not be dealing just with one spray, um, that there, there might be a number of sprays. So it's the, it's, so the international um, thresholds that we've got now being taken mainly out of the US. Now they have a different cost structure to their farming system. Um, so they, they are different, but we need to get more um, I suppose local information, local data to support those thresholds um, across a range of crops, but also um, a, across the, the crop life cycle, if you like, um, that we need to understand that um, we don't want to get into a position where you, the, the cost of control is far greater than the impact caused by full armyworm. We need to pull up well before it gets, gets out of hand. Um, so understanding the, um, the decision and the benefits from making that application decision um, and, and the longevity of that, how, how long does that persist for before we start thinking about what's the next economic thresholds that we're now approaching, um, how to manage them early before they, and then where in the growth stage are they most likely, uh, is, are we going to suffer the, the greatest impact? Because um, that will be diff different given the the pest pressures and when they when the pest pressure might be at its greatest in that growing season. Okay, so there was some interesting discussion there on on the um, thresholds and uh, people's thoughts there. Um, one of the things that I realised I haven't touched on here, and I, I think that one, if I press again, is probably the last uh, dot point that I had there, but um, what was it? Um, moths and moon phases was something that came up and people had an interest in. Uh, is there anyone that was able to or would like to comment on that particularly? I'm just throwing that in as a random thing that, that people did actually comment on as, as seeing something some interest in. Um, Janine, you're talking the moon phase uh, with moth activity, is that right? Or? Yes, yeah, how that affects moth activity. Um, I'm not sure we have a um, good set of da trapping data starting from March until now. So this nearly, nearly around 10, nearly nine months of data we have. But I, I could go back to in the trapping data, we can look at the moon phase and see is any activity on moth is high or low during that time. We could look into that. But honestly, superficially, I didn't see any big difference um, on the moth numbers or egg clay pattern in the crop. More or less, we see constant egg clay happening in the crop when the sweet corn start germinating. More or less, probably Andrew might comment on this too. Uh, Andrew and Tor also have a good experience on monitoring in the field on a regular basis. Um, um, so my feeling is the egg clay is more or less happening every day in the field. Uh, so I'm not sure moon phase have any effect on the that one. So maybe Heliotis is it more had some effect? Is it more like the temperature range? Is like what? How long does it have to stay cold for for them to? to actually die off or, or go away. Yeah, possibly, Andrew, yeah. Okay, are there any other topics? I'll just break, open it up to anything that uh, people would like to discuss or you know, note as a bit of a gap that they've identified. Um, as we see, I think we've reached the, the natural conclusion of the um, the session here this afternoon, but we still have a bit of time up. So if anybody would like to comment further, I'll just open it up to, to general topics that haven't been touched on yet. Jenny, on that one of the area we didn't touch on the spray application area. Yes. You, you listed there, we didn't touch. Okay. Yeah, the spray application still is the biggest issue for 
polar may be specially controlling the and the and the third or fourth insta larvae are bird you know they mostly moving into the central part of the crop like in the world they moving inside they mostly getting the spray penetration into that air targeted area is bit of one of the challenging problem now so sometime actually the chemical still is working but inefficient controls possibly due to targeting into the and in the into the world area for especially in the vegetative stage and also when they move into the copse is bit hard to control them so that more be one of the things need to be look into that any modification in the existing um spray application technique or something can be improved to targeting into the um into the proper you know the way the big big um full army worm stages are there okay so modifying the the technique for when they're in the third to fourth in star and moving into the the corn whirl is that yeah you want egg egg sketch uh, within few within a week they all moving into the the hiding positions where possible so they so that is a bit of issue now okay any other further comments there So it is a temperature one. Do we actually know how long it has to stay cold for them to disappear? I think there is some international data on that, but I'm not qualified to comment too hard, uh, too far on that, Melina. Uh, so it's it's a cumulative effect. So there's not a, a point. It's not like a cliff where they approach a cold temperature and you drop off and the population crashes. It's a it's a gradual. Uh, well, unless you get a frost a series of frosts i suppose that might do it but uh it, it essentially reduces the lot the um increases the mortality at every life stage so less hatching less successful molting in each of the larval instars less successful pupation less successful moth emergence so because that's the way the population decline accumulates it takes some time to get there it's not a not a sudden thing and Andrew, you know, there is some international um, literature on the effects of temperature and, and mortality and so on that I could send you if you like. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, Subra, you know, another comment? Um, I don't know, we, um, we find still the full army worm in um, the the temperate the minimum temperature is about 10 degrees they still finding some activity happening um, in the in the field they still the larvae is growing and feeding on the crop so um, we didn't find any slow down during the winter time here there's there's some some increase in september october when the spring started the numbers really high but they um, life cycle duration getting a bit shorter when the spring spring started here so possibly i roughly i'm thinking around 20 21 days they from x2 getting to the large stage larvae um it's taking up so there may be something actually honestly i don't have a good data to support that uh, there's only a, some observational type data we got Okay, well, there's been a lot of comments on different things today, um, and we've heard a lot of different uh, bits of information that have come through from um, what research and development is underway and what we should perhaps look to for the future and where the gaps are. One of the interesting things that was noted uh, when we were discussing the setup for this webinar was um, extension and um, is the information getting out there? Are people having to, to hunt for it? Do they know where to look? Uh, those sorts of things and it didn't rate very highly or communication you know didn't rate very highly in people's um, interest levels um, so does that mean that there is more um, information flow than than what we had interpreted or would anybody like to comment on the extension side of things yeah Janine I'll make Comment on that one. Um, just 
forwarding on from what Melina was saying earlier with regards to local labor groups and things like that and consultancy groups getting together and sharing information within a local region. Um, I cover a vast area. So the last time I was tied up in a local, local area was when I was down in Gundawindi in 2011 and we had small focus groups and things like that of, you know, we we're all competing agros, but we shared information for the betterment of our growers. Um, I'm not saying that's not going on anymore, but one thing where I think it would be valuable is if the information, so as an example, in the Burdick and, and the Bowen area, if that information can be communicated to similar groups within other areas within Queensland, New South Wales and further south as the problem persists. So the areas where it's not yet at the, the coal face, perhaps Correct. get in, get in ahead. As an example, the guys in Bundaberg at the moment, because they haven't had a, a major influx of pest pressure, they're sort of still walking around scratching their heads going, well, where are we going to end up? Um, because it is an unknown. But at the same time, I get the feeling, having dealt with a lot of the agronomists up there, that they, I get the feeling that, if, I'm not saying all of them, but a number of them are sitting around waiting for a problem to fester prior to going, okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay, um, John Duff, I think if you're still here, I think you and, and Zara Hall were involved at least in getting the Lockyer coordinated with the grower group down there and, and preparing them or giving them some insight into what to expect with, with fall army worms. So that's um, to be congratulated. Did you have any comments that you wanted to make at all? Um, no, not really. I think we've covered, or you've covered everything that needs to be done. Um, <clears throat> I know Zara is keen on um having some sort of get together with the agros again um and i think it'd be great to i guess show them some of the other um caterpillars as well because i know when we did it previously we just had um fall armyworm larvae mm -hmm. so it would be nice to have a range of larvae and then see how um, how they can actually differentiate one from the other because sometimes that can be a little bit tricky, um, especially if you haven't seen it a lot. Um, so, but I think we're, Zara was thinking about doing something in the new year on that, in that area. Are there better yeah. ways to engage with people to make sure that they're getting this information across? Because one of the things that I had picked up was that um, some growers particularly felt that perhaps they were a bit on their own and they, they didn't, you know, like they were researching their own mechanisms to try and resolve the issues around fall armyworm and, and looking to counterparts in the US. And I just sort of felt that there was this, you know, call or need to have um, a focus on research and development that is underway to give people some hope and to give them ideas of where to look to it uh, and those sorts of things. So is there a better way to, to get the communication out to people? Is this a gap that we're needing to address better, differently? Or... I guess it's like the um, Soil Wealth website. We, we need something along the same sort of lines where um, there's a portal where growers can actually go and access a lot of information that's been generated, not just for this pest, but a whole heap of other pests. Um, but how you go about doing that, I'm not sure. Well, I think that's exactly right, John. So, you know, you'll see through all the communications around the grains industry and, and that, um, you know, I think Stuart put up a little bit on the continuity plan that there are references made to the beat sheet. So that's our online platform for grains and cotton. And, uh, you know, it's now got the such a good reputation that that's where people go if they want to find something. And it's, um, you know, constantly archiving material that goes on and we're putting in, uh, you know, we're adding pages all the time with different resources for fall armyworm and so on. So I think that that, you know, I think you're absolutely right. It would be great to have some sort of centralised um, platform that, uh, you know, people could contribute to that that just sits there and becomes a sort of growing resource around um, yeah. availability of information. There is actually an international version of that, which um, Scott Wallace alerted me to. Um, there is a, a hub and it's got an amazing amount of information there and experts that answer chat forums and all that sort of thing. Um, so I don't know whether we're reinventing the wheel or we need something more local but it is amazing what you find when you're out there. And I think part of the issue is that much of this is just um, 
dispersed between different agencies and, um, you know, is there a role that PHA can play in this, Stuart, or what, how do we look to that? It, um, yeah, potentially there is a role we can play, um, but when, especially when we look at extension and, you know, knowledge and information needs, um, they are different. Um, growers aren't growers, They're, they are, and advisors aren't advisors. They've got different needs. They do have their own networks. Um, some of them will go straight to the horse's mouth and develop relationships with some of our leading researchers to get both here and abroad um, to get that um, knowledge um, and to test their own thinking um, straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. There's and where the, where there's others that expect the information and uh, and rely on information coming to them. So I think um, I'm just cautious about developing a one size fits all sort of extension model. However. I am, you know, I am in favour of um, a single source of truth and how we can encourage behaviours about understanding where those pest threats are coming from. So, like the beet sheet, you know, how how do we undertake surveillance and monitoring across the country for a whole range of different pests, and we communicate it in one source, in in one place, that it adds value to different um, networks and different groups around the country that can use that information to their, their best thing. I think there are, there's a number of resources that are available now. We've just got to make them, um, um, yeah, um, there, there will be, widely. yeah, yeah publicise them, but I think, I think pressure tests them too. Okay. I think, um, you know, the role for, um, for certain groups to say, is this information credible or is it not, you know, is it just, um, myths and legends um, we're talking about or is it factual based on scientific evidence I think that's the the role that we've got to um, you know look for that credibility and I think um, a lot of advisors and a lot of growers and a lot of organizations like PHA, Growcom and others will be looking for that credibility how how um, yeah what's how how um, how good is this information how reliable is this information because um, you can find lots of stuff on Google um, and it may or may not be truthful or relevant or in fact um, applicable or legal um, in Australia. So I think we've got to uh, treat that with um, a bit of, um, it, I mean, we're all, we're all grown ups, we're all adults, we should be able to deal with that. Um, yeah, but j just trying to um, understand how, how we provide information um, and um, there's some projects that need to provide information and they've got working on really good stuff. And there's other research projects that are best left in the laboratory because it's not necessarily applicable on farm. It's good to know about, but it's not going to help a management decision. Um, we need to think that through a bit too. Okay. Well, um, that's really helpful. Uh, it's good discussion to have. And, um, I think we're um, coming to a, a natural conclusion there, unless there's other things that people would like to talk about. I'll give it the last opportunity for, for people to um, to comment or to have some more say. All righty. Well, thank you very much to everyone who's participated and to, who's stayed on. I see the participants are dropping a little bit now, but. Um, we did have uh, quite a number, which is good. And we thank our um, our presenters again, uh, Greg and Stuart and Melina and Lisa, who's no longer here. Um, but uh, thank you very much. And we'll sign off here. We'll have a, um, uh, a present, uh, sorry, a recording of the webinar will be made available in about a week's time. And uh, we'll put some notes together too. And if there's um, presentations that are available through the, um, the slideshows that were put together today, we can also uh, send those out as well. So um, with that, I'll sign off and thank everybody once again and um, turn you loose for the rest of the afternoon. Thanks, thank Janine. Thanks, Janine.